On behalf of the uh, IEEE uh, GRSS Image Analysis and Technical Fusion Committee, uh, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce um, our uh, esteemed speaker today, Professor Abhijit Mahalanambis, who is uh, faculty in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at uh, the University of Arizona. Uh, his uh, primary research interests are uh, in machine vision and computational imaging, uh, and, and he's, been, he's worked a lot on optical imagery of different kinds. Um, he um, is a fellow of SPIE, OSA, and IEEE, uh, and his, um, his topic today is on context-based estimation of class priors for improving performance of classifiers with a large number of classes. So without further ado, uh, uh, Dr. Mahalan Abis, uh, the floor is yours. And uh, j just a quick note on uh, the, the webinar. If uh, there are questions, uh, what we can do is we can uh, sort of just hold them till the end uh, and, and sort of have a Q&A session towards the end, if that's okay. So. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Prasad. And, um... I really appreciate this opportunity to present this talk and thank you everyone for um, coming to the talk. Um, and uh, before I start, um, I'd like to preface it by saying this is sort of our work in progress um, and some of the results are very preliminary. I should preface it by saying that, uh, but I thought I'd share it with you folks as, um, uh, as a possibly an interesting topic to at least uh, discuss and chat about today. Um, okay, so with that said, um, basically I'll be talking about a uh, very well-known problem that we all know um, is an issue, uh, but I think that um, uh, the number of uh, times this problem has been looked at in the community and the literature is probably um, still not that many. Uh, there is, of course, a lot of work in this area, but the issue is this, that you can train a classifier um, to uh, you know, on a lot of classes with the ImageNet, you can train them for a thousand classes. Uh, that's an example of a large classifier. But when you deploy it, it's very unlikely that you're going to encounter all these classes all at the same time, right? So um, it has been observed um, by many people. Uh, as an example, there's a reference here. Um, this paper, I think, uh, uh, was uh, published in Nature sometime back. Um, that context is important for knowing how to apply knowledge. And as humans, um, we all know that this is a big part in how we make sense uh, when we look at things, right? So this diagram just simply shows that, you know, depending on your environment or your time of day or season or location or some prior knowledge, you will sort of temper or um, put some sanity check on what you believe you are seeing, right? So here in this example, if you're in a restaurant setting on the top left here, I don't know, can you guys see my mouse? Or are you able to see the mouse now? Okay. Um, if you're in a restaurant setting, um, you know, you're very likely to um, see people. Um, so the prior probability will be very high but hopefully you don't see any cars unless somebody crashes in there or something like that. Um, so car probability is zero. Likewise, I believe this is implied to be some sort of a uh, uh, parking lot perhaps um, where um, you have prior probability of some objects um, in the restaurant, it's chairs and cutlery and whatnot. If it's a parking lot next to some sort of a stadium, I think this is, then you expect some um, signage poles and the probability of people is probably uh, greater uh, is not that high but the probability of uh, cars is pretty high if you're in a parking lot right um, here these are examples of um, the uh, the frequency of small cars uh, large cars and trucks uh, as a function of time of day um, or different days of the week so all of this is just to say, um, that context is important. And um, if you know some priors about um, the setting you are in, the context uh, in which you are making the classifications, then you can rule out um, decisions that just aren't uh, possible, right? Um, and this is a surveillance application where 
they're looking for humans, uh, and that is its own kind of scenario and context. Okay, so the problem is that we generally don't know ahead of time um, which classes may be present, and um, and you know the prior probabilities are not given. But the question is, um, can we infer these uh, dynamically um, based on um, some statistics that we already know about how uh, classes, uh, you know, how the decisions, uh, decision errors are made, the, how a classifier responds to a given class. And of course, we know part of this information from the confusion matrix itself, right? So how do we take that and combine it with the actual observations that we have um, in real time when the classifier is deployed and come up with a sort of a, a, a dynamic estimate of what the class priors may be. So the concept is, um, you know, this is a situation where you keep in mind that the classifier is in some sort of a, a deployed condition. There's a continuous stream of images that are coming in. And the premise is that because it's in a given environment or a given application, um, you have some classes appearing frequently or some classes are, uh, are occurring um, quite uh, frequently, but the classifier itself has been trained on a very large number of classes. So just to use an example, maybe the classifier knows 100 classes or 1,000 classes, but you're deploying it in a scenario where maybe there's only 20 classes occurring, right? So <clears throat> if, it, if, if you are deploying it in a situation where there truly are a lot of classes, comparable to the total number of classes that has been trained on, then this method will not work. The premise is that the subset of classes it's, in, it's encountering is relatively small or constrained by the environment or the application or the context, right? So in that sense, context in, uh, in the, um, for the purposes of our talk, uh, we are going to use context interchangeably with this idea of prior probability of occurrence of classes. Um, so that's the that's what we mean by context in this talk. Okay. Um, so some very simple observations. Um, you know, in general, um, the uh, the probability of error. So, so if you just look at this term, it's kind of obvious that the probability of being correct, which of course is one minus the total probability of being wrong, but the terms that are contributing the error probability uh, always increase with the number of classes um, that are there, uh, which could be confused with the true class of the object, right? So it's, it's kind of a, um, uh, you know, an obvious statement uh, that if you have more number of classes as viable decisions, um, then of course you're gonna have higher probability of error because you're confusing, there's a potential to confuse the true class with one of the other possible solutions. So the idea of this is to actually limit the number of uh, classes that are allowed in the decision strategy. Okay, so based on that, a very naive approach uh, for the estimation of prior probability can be based on just looking at the histogram of the decisions coming out of the classifier. And um, the idea is as follows. I mean, of course, from Bayes' rule, you have um, the, the posterior probability is given by this equation where all these terms are defined at the usual way. Um, the only thing um, that I would point out is that the, the probability that the classifier decides that class I is present when the true class is class I, um, which is the probability of correct recognition is the same as what we also mean by recall. Um, and so this uh, quantity can often be expressed uh, using whatever the recall value of the classifier is, T sub recall sub I. Uh, that's that's uh, just another way to denote the same probability. And likewise, the probability that the class I is really present when the classifier decides class I is also known as precision, right? Uh, and is denoted by T precision of I. So just by rearranging terms in the uh, base formula, the base uh, rule, you can see that the estimate uh, of the prior probability 
is, uh, can be written in terms of precision and recall um, as shown over here, where probability of CI is the overall probability of observing the decision for class I for any given event, right? And this certainly is observable. This probability of CI uh, is what the classifier is putting out. How many times does it call, uh, make the decision in favor of class I? And very simply, again, in a naive sense, the, the, um, the probability that the classifier decides class I, if you have N test images, is simply the number of times it decided class I, right? So a naive estimate is just given over here. It's the ratio of the precision and recall multiplied by the ratio of the number of times you see the decision uh, in favor of class I out of the N test images. And if precision and recall are approximately equal, then an estimate of the prior probability is just the ratio of, uh, is directly basically um, the, the percentage of times the classifier uh, calls, calls in favor of class I. Uh, and this is a very naive estimate. It doesn't really take into account any of the joint, um, you know, joint say probabilities of making errors, or how the errors across the different classes, if they're correlated or dependent on one another, uh, but it's, it's an approach. Okay, now to illustrate this, um, in fact, for many of the experiments that we're doing uh, in this talk, and I said some of this work is a little bit preliminary, so we haven't yet done everything. Uh, we have used CIFAR 100 to date, uh, but uh, right now we're doing some work with ImageNet, um, but those results aren't yet available. I'll show you some initial results on XView as well uh, towards the end. But here um, for CIFAR 100, it's possible to divide the data set um, into these, uh, let's call them contexts or these groups, which are sort of uh, possible um, scenarios in which a classifier could be deployed. So we'll be referring to these 12 categories or these 12 contexts or these 12 scenarios, if you will. And, um, and, and say, for instance, in this group called water animals, there are 12 classes of the CIFAR database, uh, food containers contains five and so on and so forth, right? And these are kind of, the, uh, to give you an idea as I talk about the experiments, um, how many images were there to estimate parameters and how many images were there to actually get the test results. So this is just there uh, to give you some idea, but uh, nothing specific about this is important. But so based on that uh, grouping of those 12 classes, um, this is uh, an example of what we mean by that naive estimation method um, for a particular classifier uh, when it is tested with the classes that are in this category called water animals. And like I said over here, there's 12 different classes. And so you will see the class number on this axis. There's 100 possible classes, but the ones with the blue um, bar um, is the, are the classes, the, the CIFAR 10 classes that are present in this category called water animals, right? And so the blue ones, the blue bars over here uh, show the true number of images uh, that were there in this particular scenario, the test images. And these red plots, uh, the red bars on the plot rather, um, they are the, um, the values um, that we calculated for this naive estimate. So it's this guy over here. Rather, it's uh, n times uh, p hat of omega i, because there is, uh, you know, the, we are actually showing this in terms of the number of images and not the probability. So it's multiplied by n. Um, and you can see that this estimate is. Um, you know, uh, in many cases, it's comparable to the blue, right? So the red is uh, based on the decision uh, frequencies, if you will, the decision histogram of the classifier. And the good news is that the very large numbers are truly consistent with the actual uh, classes that were present. But what is important and the, really the source of the errors 
is that all these little values that are over here uh, in the plot uh, are the misclassifications. So, so these represent smaller probabilities, but they are the probability that something wrong, uh, decision error um, is being made when the object is being classified as one of the classes uh, that is not even present, right, at the input. And this is for the other uh, group, the food containers group. Similar kind of thing where the blue lines are the true, um, if you will, counts of these objects that are present. And the, the large red uh, numbers are the estimated counts of those objects. But these little numbers over here are the, um, uh, are the errors that are being made because these classes were not even present, but the classifier did not know that going into this deployment, right? So the question is, what can we do to clean these up? Okay, so now um, what I mentioned uh, is um, when you know, if you will, the scenario um, or something about the scenario. So you're being deployed, let's say, um, to monitor uh, some sort of a marine environment. You certainly expect birds perhaps in that environment or aquatic animals or fish, um, but you don't expect, I don't know, uh, airplanes or trains in a marine environment perhaps. But that's one sort of thing. And one can even ahead of time say that, okay, because I'm being deployed in a known environment, I will, uh, as an expert, uh, impose um, some sort of class priors uh, just because I know certain things will never occur. Right. So one could handle the previous situation just by saying, OK, I'm going to allow these subset of classes to occur because I know where I'm deploying it. But that won't work when you have arbitrary mixtures of classes. Right. So for arbitrary mixtures of classes, we need to be a little bit more um, formal, perhaps, but not too formal. In fact, this is also a rather simple um, estimation technique, um, but it's based on the following observation that um, you know you can take the original uh, well this simple equation that the decisions that are being made by the classifier is really a class-wise histogram is a mixture of class-wise histograms uh, weighted by the probability of that class occurring right so this probability of ci given wj is um, is what um, <clears throat> Uh, can be actually these things can be measured um, during training, so for instance, right? Because if you think about it, this class-wise histogram is uh, really very similar to the row of the confusion matrix. So when you test your classifier after training, you kind of have an idea of what um, the distribution of errors is going to be. You know the ground truth, and you of course know how many errors are being made for every class. So you kind of have this, have this ahead of time. And um, this probability of CI is actually what you're observing, of course, when the classifier making its de decisions. So over time, you acquire a, um, a, you observe the decisions, look at the decision frequency, and this is the observed histogram of the classifications. If you assume that you know this ahead of time, certainly it should be possible then to figure out um, the prior probabilities. And, and one can set up a system of linear equations easily to do this. Uh, the matrix H is defined as this uh, class-wise um, histograms, which can be thought of loosely as normalized rows of the confusion matrix as its columns. Um, you, you create this matrix with those histograms as its columns. Um, and then this is the vector which represents the, um, the histogram of the observed decisions. And then you can readily write the simple equation um, to relate the two. The question is then now, how do you solve for it? So that becomes a little bit more, um, well, let's just say that simple inverse won't do, uh, because if you just simply invert this matrix, um, you'll get negative values for W, which is, um, not, you know, of course, allowed because these are probabilities. So the easy thing to do is simply use quadratic programming, 
So you're trying to minimize this uh, error subject to um, the two conditions that we have to impose on W, that the sum of all this probability should equal one, and that each individual probability has to be positive, basically between zero and one, right? And uh, that's an easy, I mean, that's readily solvable using any number of numerical techniques. So now um, some examples of that to show you. Um, this is a, a example using ResNet 18. Um, again, for now with the CIFAR 100 data set. Um, and what you're seeing over here is a visualization of that matrix H. Um, it is very similar to, of course, the Confucian matrix, but it's, uh, it's really each row is the class-wise um, decision histogram, right? So for the 100 classes, each row represents, given that class, what, what is the probability of um, getting a decision as one of the other uh, 99 classes? Of course, you want the diagonal limits to be the largest. And now it's normalized between zero and one. So uh, that's the only distinction between this and the confusion matrix. Um, and then, you know, in, we, and now we are talking about arbitrary mixtures of classes. So in, we created a case where there was only four uh, classes that were involved in the mixture that was used for testing the classifier. And if you look at the decision histogram, um, just the, you know, how the classifier reacted to those four classes, uh, the data set, then you get, of course, all these little, little errors um, because those are just the classifier deciding um, making decisions uh, for classes that are not even present, right? It's only these four classes present. Of course, the four largest ones are the classes that are present, but you're losing some performance because these misclassifications are going on. And if you could ahead of time uh, eliminate these classes as possible solutions or automatically, then some of this error that you have over here will be recovered hopefully into the right categories, right? So now the simple uh, inverse of the matrix, of course, doesn't give you, um, you know, the best solution because you get these negative values. So we, we, we keep it in the mix just to see how well it does. Uh, one could always say that these values are small and you can threshold them. Um, but um, this is the, um, the solution that's obtained using quadratic programming. Um, and you can see that uh, it has cleaned up a lot of these errors, um, a lot of these errors have been cleaned up uh, over here. The way I have been moving my mouse, uh, so this is the first one that I was talking about where these um, errors are, uh, are driven, produced by the classifier. This is the, um, the simple matrix inverse one with the negative values, and then this is the one with the uh, quadratic programming where um, a lot of these errors have been cleaned up. I apologize because I think I was moving my mouse on the wrong screen again. Um, anyway, um, the point being that this, if you look at this plot, these blue ones are the ideal uh, prior probabilities based on the mixture of classes that was in the test set. And this red line over here is the estimated uh, prior probability um, using the quadratic programming. This is using the naive method and this is using the, uh, the matrix inverse method. Okay, now another case, this is an example where there are five classes. And this is to show you that it isn't always perfect. Of course, nothing is. But in this case, um, similarly, uh, these five classes with the blue lines are present. If you just look at the naive method, which is based on the observation, then of course you still have all these um, possible errors, uh, you know, because of the misclassification. The negative uh, values that you get with the inverse makes this method suspect. And then this one is the quadratic programming method, which has cleaned up a lot of these errors. But unfortunately, uh, both the quadratic programming and this matrix inverse seem to completely miss this method, uh, this this class over here. Oops, sorry. 
uh, this fifth class over here. So this is actually more to say that even though the problem formulation seems relatively simple, bordering almost perhaps, and some might say the night method is trivial, there is something challenging about this because it's not obvious what, you know, the, this case, uh, case one is, um, shows that, you know, this is a hundred class classifier. We're testing with four classes. It predicts those four classes and we can clean up um, the errors very well. But in this particular iteration of it, and we have tried with many different combinations, it can easily miss a uh, class completely, which is there uh, quite a bit. Uh, the naive method, of course, gets that class, uh, but you know, that is um, uh, to be expected because many decisions were made in favor of that class. But if we use this uh, mixture of uh, Gaussian, uh, mixture, of, mixture of histograms approach, then we miss this one class. And so that begs the question um, is that actually our model may not be complete, right? Or there some needs to be some additional constraint on the reconstruction to make sure that we don't miss this classes. So I think that even though it's uh, relatively straightforward in concept, there is something uh, about this that, um, uh, that, that, it, that needs to be explained, uh, which, uh, sh which should explain why it misses a class that's pretty obviously there. Okay, so now based on that, here is an example of the kinds of results uh, that we see. Um, so this is for all the 12 scenarios um, in CIFAR 100. By the way, we did not impose any knowledge of scenarios. So this is not because we knew which scenario it belonged to, but we used um, this um, arbitrary mixtures uh, model so that, that we're actually estimating it in terms of um, a sum of class-wise histograms. And you can see in this plots that the blue curve uh, the blue the blue bar in each case is the baseline performance of the network that is by itself right and all these other three lines um, this orange green and red are the uh, the three methods that we talked about the naive approach uh, the matrix inverse or linear approach or the linear optimum which is the quadratic optimization technique all three are better than the blue one all the time um, and so this is the tabular form of it. And this purple line over here uh, for each of these classes is the perfect prior. That is, if you do know um, what the scenario is, and if you impose it ahead of time, uh, then this is, uh, this, that would be this purple line. So the purple line is kind of, if you will, an upper bound of the performance improvement that you knew exactly what classes were present. And then these three are three different closely related, but different methods of estimating the prior probabilities. Um, and if you look at it in the uh, tabular form, um, you'll see that for almost all cases, the base, uh, whatever the value of the base um, network is for these 12 scenarios, there is um, almost a 10%, uh, as much as, 10, I should say not always, but as much as 10% improvement in quite a few cases in terms of the performance improvement, right? So it goes, let's say from 70% to 79% here um, or from 81% to 92%. Not all of them improve by 10%, but many of them do. Um, and then this is the perfect one where if you knew the context. So the point of this is that um, uh, there's, this is a low hanging fruit that can be applied to any classifier uh, that can be applied in a situation where uh, you have the ability to maybe deploy the classifier, uh, observe the decision histogram over some period of time, estimate this prior probabilities and apply it back on the, um, on the output side and, and get a performance boost. Um, of course, you have to keep an eye on the change in any distribution uh, so that maybe that uh, the the estimation of prior probabilities once it has started uh, can go on continuously in some sense, um, and and so one might have to think about how is this integrated into an overall system flow 
to get the benefit, but it seems like one might be able to leverage it and get a, uh, let's say a five to 10% boost in the performance for any given deployment. Now, the premise is, again, I should repeat, is that the classifier knows a lot of classes, a much greater number of classes than what are encountered in practice. Um, and that uh, number two, um, if this is correct, then it holds the potential for possibly taking a weaker classifier and bumping up its performance to some acceptable levels. Um, whereas, you know, some of the more powerful classifiers. So the, so the second point is actually what I'm trying to say is that um, it'll only work if the classifier is imperfect, right? So large number of classes, but for any given class, there is leakage or classification errors across the uh, other known classes, if you will. But if the classifier is very strong and the class confusion matrix is very diagonal to begin with, there are no errors or very few errors, then of course this doesn't help because you've already maximized the performance. But for the um, you know, likely scenario that you have a large classifier, but it's not perfect, uh, then this is, and it's encountering fewer classes than what it knows, then this is a possible way to recover some of those errors. Um, any questions so far? Oh, I guess we'll wait till the end. Uh, so that's fine. No, um, go ahead. Uh, we can stop for a minute to see if there's any questions about this. Okay. I, so I the, uh -huh. go ahead. You don't mind? Um, Not at all. Um, so is, is like, at the end of the day, the, like, let's say ResNet, right? It's, it's it's extracting features and then there's a decision there's there's a decision surface that's originally based on a lot more classes right like based on this do you have any insights or intuition behind what changes uh when you apply this method sort of uh at, at a fun yeah uh, I, i'm not sure if i can phrase the question uh, yeah. yeah, it's a it's a good question because we're not really retraining the classifier, right? Yeah. Um, and so the decision space hasn't been touched, but I think what we are just simply saying is that certain decision boundaries are off limit. Um, and I think what we're doing is just filtering out wrong decisions based on some conviction that these classes could not have been present. Um, but then where will it go, right? Where will that mass go? And so the hope is, and I think just at an intuitive level, it's recovering some of that error into the next most likely class that is inside that's in context. So let's say that, you know, the highest logic or the highest confidence was something that's not present, but the second highest is. So perhaps by eliminating the one that would have taken up that vote, it's allowing the second highest to pop up and be counted. Um, and the second part of that same question is that if these errors are, let's call it within context, right? It's not gonna fix those. Uh, so if there was an inherent error between our confusion between two classes, both of whom are present, then this will not fix that either. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. So, okay. So the next part of what I'm going to present was an attempt, if you will, um, on making this a little bit more dynamic so that we are not um, estimating histograms, part of which is you know, offline um, or uh, inverting matrices and things like this. But the question that we asked was that, can all of this be done in some sense in a knowledge distillation framework? And, um, the idea was simply that let's say that there is a, uh, a good, powerful network that we call the teacher network. And this knows, let's say, the very large number of classes, 100 classes or 1,000 classes. But what we want to do is um, on the fly, uh, distill knowledge of about the subset of classes that are being encountered in the deployed environment. So what's inside this red box is actually a very simple CNN. And we're motivated by two things. One is um, the full knowledge of this is again, not required for the same reasons that we talked about before, right? Um, 
so if we're only gonna if we know 100 classes but we're only going to encounter 20 classes can we as the stream of images comes in dynamically sort of distill that knowledge about the 20 classes here and uh, and come up with decisions for those 20 classes at some level of accuracy um that is of course we don't want it to be any less than the teacher network but you know as good as the teacher network hopefully but because we're dealing with only 20 classes instead of 100 um could we just benefit from the simple rule that i said at the beginning you know fewer classes means fewer terms contributing to the error probability and in that sense uh getting a higher um uh, overall accuracy out of it relative to the 20 classes mind you not relative to the 100 classes so now the one thing that this requires of course um is that as long as uh but this is an adaptive method right so if it converges on say the classes that are present but then the context begins to drift or let's say that um, the time of day has changed like we were saying in the very beginning or season have changed or the density of objects has changed, then we need to have some sort of method to uh, keep that in mind so that the adaptation can um, can keep up with it. And so in that sense, there is a need to know uh, unknown objects. So let's say that this has encountered um, the frequently occurring object objects, but then every now and then something might come along and you don't know it. So you have to declare an unknown. Um, just to uh, elaborate on that point a little bit more. Let's say that you were observing a group of people during sunny weather and all of a sudden it begins to rain. Now umbrellas pop into the um, scene, but you haven't learned umbrellas. So you have to know that I don't know what an umbrella is and then uh, go back to the, um, the large knowledge base uh, so that you can get uh, decisions about an umbrella coming through and for this to adapt to the knowledge of umbrella. So, um, so in that framework, what we uh, decided to do is come up with a paradigm for learning and uh, for, for knowledge distillation, where basically the decision initially comes from um, the teacher network, um, but then, you know, the output of this is the student network is of course learning by minimizing the error between the two, but every now and then the, the student network has to know that, uh, or to say that it's an unknown object, right? So this unknown or out of distribution detection becomes an important problem or sub problem in this framework. So with that said, um, the way we uh, formulated this strategy is based on um, contrastive learning or by using a triplet loss function where um, what we do is for an input image, um, we are not only teaching it the class label, but we are also teaching it um, the attention map, if you will, uh, because we have to know, in addition to the label, what the teacher thought was the salient part of the image or the semantically important part of the image uh, so that the student learns not only the labels, but learns to understand the image in the same way that the teacher does. But of course, our premise is that we're doing this for fewer number of classes that are actually in the stream. But we also wanted to sort of say, okay, um, when it doesn't classify an image properly, it should sort of declare it as an unknown. So keeping that in mind, um, we are giving, um, so the teacher's uh, decision and the teacher's attention map is the anchor, if you will, this ATK. And what we're what we are doing is we are encouraging the students correct decision um, to converge, if you will, onto the teacher's attention map. So in this case, this is a man on a camel. Um, and so this is the student learning um, to not only classify it as man on a camel, but learns the attention map similar to this. But at the same time, we are taking the one which is the um, the strongest incorrect decision made by the student and forcing that to be very large, uh, the error between that and the teacher's attention to be very large, right? Typical triplet loss kind of thing. So the, the teacher's attention map is the anchor and the correct one and the incorrect one give you the two other things that we need to define this triplet loss. And at the end of the day, what that does, and these are other examples of the same kind of thing happening, 
At the end of the day, what that does is essentially you end up with, um, uh, with, with um, a manifold that looks like this. Um, I'll go back to the other charts in a minute to tell you what this was, but to visualize it, what you're seeing over here is in a mixture of data where there is, um, these are the known classes as learned by the student. Um, the students, this is a TSME manifold, and you can see that all the, and these, these clusters that form in the data um, are really the classes that are really present and the student network has learned well, whereas classes that are out of distribution or unknowns are things that the student has not adapted to that can pop up and will need to be the rejected. We don't want things that are not known to be misclassified as one of the things that are present in the, in the uh, stream. Uh, by doing this optimization, um, those are nicely separated from the cluster of the known data. Um, so, Going back again, so this is this is this. Um, not only is it the label, but also this attention map criteria together give you the separation. So going back to the um, the example that I was showing you earlier, these are again different different examples that show you um, the same concept that the student is learning the teacher's attention map and learning how to separate um, the attention map of the the false the strongest false decision away from that. Um, and then with respect to um, the CIFAR 100 data set, um, again, these are those six classes. I think there was 12 classes in the previous one here. We we're using six of those group groupings. Um, actually, the reason there are six, let me tell you why. There are actually 12 subclasses, but we are, we are treating the aquatic animals in this first case, C1, we've combined two things. We are treating the aquatic animals as the classes that are present in the stream, but the food containers is occasionally uh, things that pop up that are out of class um, and has to be relearned. So we're trying to mimic a situation where it's deployed in an environment where normally we would get uh, either aquatic animals, flora, fruits and vegetables, and so on. but to test it, to see its adaptability, to see its ability to not confuse unknown things, we are going to test it with things that it has not seen before. Uh, in which case, you know, uh, it's it's the um, like for instance, the in the environment of fruits and vegetables, what how will the network react if we were to test it with furniture? Let's say, for instance, right. So, and these are the number of images that belong to what we call the in class that the, net, the student network has adapted to. And this is the number of images that we are going to test it with to see if it knows that it's not one of the things it has adapted to. And the reason this makes sense is because the teacher network knows hundreds of classes. This would not be an issue if we were just using the teacher network. Our goal here is to use that student network because we know that there's only going to be, you know, um, 10, uh, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 frequently occurring classes. And what we're trying to do is get is getting a higher recognition rate for those classes. Um, but at the same time, we now have to make provision that if it is not one of those classes, does the student network know to throw the problem back to the teacher network? Or if this new unknown thing keeps on uh, occurring very frequently, then of course the student network has to adapt to it as a new but frequent class. And then this result was also done with, um, this experiment was also done with the tiny image net. Um, and here's the groupings of the in-class and out-class and the number of images that were used for both. Um, this plot just shows you, um, you know, on the horizontal axis, um, you have the adaptation epoch. Um, there are four different networks that we tried as the student network. I think the teacher network was always a dense net 190. Um, and um, the student network was an Alex net, uh, VGG16, ResNet uh, 18, and ResNet 50. And um, what, what we're showing over here is once the stream starts, the green line is really the accuracy of the student network adapting to a new 
context. And what you're seeing over here, horizontal line is the epochs, but C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6 shows you that over time, we, we fed in images from these different contexts that I defined over here, right? So the six different contexts. So we are asking the student network, we're feeding in images from a given context. We're allowing the student network to adapt and get a performance uh, accuracy comparable to the teacher. So this red line is the teacher, by the way. And the green line, uh, and then we change the context. And again, the student network, you know, it's not specializing for that, but it, but it does uh, adapt and come back up to the red line. And then, you know, um, and so on and so forth. So what we're showing is that the adaptation is fairly quick and it gets pretty close to the performance of the teacher network. Um, but uh, the reason we do this is because the, the student network is a much smaller, lighter network, but it is achieving at least on the subset of classes a performance comparable to that of the more powerful teacher network. Um, okay, so now I showed you this in plot before. Um, there are other such plots let me skip over this one actually. And, and let's basically just get to this one over here, um, the classification accuracy. So what you're seeing over here is those six scenarios. This BSN is, is, is the binary student network. The reason we said binary is because we actually wanted the student network to be very, very simple. Um, in fact, its coefficients are all binary um, because the lighter that student network, the faster it will run the lighter it is. And there were some other considerations we had about speed and efficiency that prompted us to make that binary. Um, but the student network by itself, if it was just the network, uh, would achieve um, you know, this, this accuracy, which is a little bit lower than that of the teacher. But in the context of the adaptation, it achieves an accuracy almost equal to that of the teacher and certainly higher than what it is by itself. Okay, now this is a little bit better way to look at it, I think instead of the table. Um, so remember this is using priors, right? So the in this plot, the, the solid blue line, the darker blue line I should say, uh, is the teacher network's performance. These are the 12 scenarios uh, for C, uh, for the CIFAR 100 case that I talked about before. And uh, the, the red line is the student network by itself. Um, then long story short, this is this, these lines with the, the new prior, the retrain and the retrain with new para priors are the cases where we have applied this idea of uh, learning the subset of classes uh, to the network. And in all cases, uh, it improves the performance over what the student network's performance was, but there's a couple of cases where the student network actually is um, better than the teacher network. And if you recall, I mentioned that that may be one of the benefits of doing it this way, because if you are limiting the number of classes that the student has to deal with, the question is that by virtue of just limiting the decision space, um, you're reducing the number of terms that contribute to the decision errors. And so for certain applications, could you maybe even outperform the teacher network? And we found some evidence over here that that kind of thing might happen. Um, but what was more interesting is actually we found that are we find we're still working on this X view data set that that happens even more when the data is uh, very skewed, the classes are very skewed, right? So this X view data set um, has, I think over 60 classes, as you all know, I'm sure. Um, but uh, we built a classifier uh, for, uh, for the top 24 classes. So now these are, uh, these are classes that are the highest occurring in this, uh, in this XView data set. But at any given time, you don't even get all of those 24. Um, in fact, this is a blow up of the same chart. I don't know if you can see it, but there is only really about four or five classes that tend to occur 
um, in greater numbers. And for those cases, what we find is that at least in this adaptive model, the student um, outperforms the teacher um, because there are so few classes that occur, but there are so many classes that the teacher was trained on. So here, if you look carefully, the blue line is again the teacher uh, and its performance is, um, you know, it is pretty good, but the student by itself is this orange curve. The student by itself is, um, well, in this case, it seems to have been better anyway, but the student by itself is doing okay because it has fewer classes to deal with. But then when you combine it with the priors, that boosts the student's performance even more, which is this gray line that you see over here. So applying the priors has a way of building up that is just a lower, let's see, false alarm space and has a way of just sort of boosting up the decision grade. So in summary, um, what we're describing here is that a network is trained to recognize a large number of classes with the counter only a subset of those classes in a given deployment scenario. And just by eliminating the possibilities uh, or eliminating, you know, uh, classes that just don't exist, um, you can recover some of the error and sort of, uh, by putting or imposing the context, if you will, the estimated context, uh, you are helping the decision strategy make simple adjustments uh, that improve the classification rate by as much as 10% for the classes that are there. And one way to do this, perhaps the more clean way, is, the, is to estimate this prior probabilities from the histograms um, based on the network's decisions and the confusion matrices uh, which actually is in its own way elegant, but um, but it tends to miss classes, and so there is some uh, there is some part of the problem that still needs to be resolved, and we're working on it. And we can also probably do this in a knowledge distillation framework, although it's a little bit more, um, in some sense, uh, complex because we are trying to actively learn the decision of the teacher in dynamic in real time, but also shows some promise that the student network, um, which can be a lighter network, learns to perform as good as the teacher or occasionally outperform it depending on um, the how much imbalance there is in the data set, so to speak. And so with that, I'd like to hand it back to you, Sora. All right, thank you so much. Uh... So sure. we'll go around and see if there's questions uh, from the audience. Any questions? Okay. Uh, I I have uh, some thoughts. So the 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 work with the overhead imagery. Uh, I, I might have missed it, but you had context there as well, right? Yes, yes, yeah. So the the idea was that, um, you know, you make the, so here, right, for instance, um, what we are doing is we're bringing in that idea of the, so this is the adaptation of the student network, right? Um, and then we're doing the naive estimation of the context on top of that and imposing that on top of the student network's performance. So it's the estimate of the prior probabilities based on just the decision histogram coming from the student network. Okay. All right. Now, uh, Ronnie uh, has a question, Ronnie. Yeah, thanks Thanks for this really nice um, presentation. It's quite interesting. Um, so the thing with priors is that they are usually helping you to improve your decision if they are correct. And That's if right. If prior is wrong, then it can go arbitrarily bad. So Absolutely. my question is, you have a feeling like, in general, how good does this work to estimate the prior correctly? And are there situations where, you know, it's it's not working so good and, and the estimation of the prior is actually hurting the general performance? Yeah, so, you know, I think that it all comes down to, let me go back here. 
um, this equation, right? So I think that it all depends on this matrix H, the condition number of that matrix in some sense. If it's a well-conditioned matrix, then you probably are getting pretty good um, estimates of the priors. And what we're saying here is that the histogram that's uh, the histogram of decisions that's observed at the output is a linear combination of the class-wise histograms, if you will, right? So for any given class, this is what the decision histogram is going to be. There isn't much uh, uh, uncertainty about this one. Um, but that said, um, what you put in, at the end of the day, um, this H is probably going to limit how accurate your estimate is because there's, there's elements, uh, there's elements of C are this probability of omega J's, right? So how much error you end up in this is going to depend on how well you measure these things. Um, and so if your test data set, and what we're saying is that your test data uh, is um, the source from where you can get these. Um, or let's say your validation data set, if you will. But if your validation data set uh, is not a good representation of what you actually will encounter, or if the uh, matrix H for other reasons, it doesn't have enough uh, number of rows, or you didn't have enough of these estimates, but you're encountering, so there's many ways this could not be, uh, this may not be a well-conditioned matrix, then I think you'll end up with some errors on this one, and that can be a problem. So you're absolutely right that if this, if the estimates of the priors uh, is bad, then it'll just mess up the whole result, right? But to the extent that this model, the simple linear model holds, um, it should be okay. But I think it all depends on how um, how well this represents the real model. No, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? I have one more, but I'll I'll see if there's somebody from the audience before I share. I mean, it's true because I think uh, what you brought up is exactly the right point, right? So for instance, this this class over here, um, the naive method gets it, but the quadratic program method does not. And that can really mess it up uh, because I if I apply these priors, I'll completely miss the, dis, uh, the, um, the uh, decisions that were made in favor of this class will be lost, right? Because I'm going to wait it out. So I think that this is, um, uh, this in my mind, at least in our work has remained unanswered. Yeah. Okay. So I have one additional question uh, on the, yeah. uh, from thinking of this from the, so you have the, the knowledge distillation framework, right? Uh, right. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, and, and so I'm thinking of, how much dis let's say the the specific set of classes that the student network is focused on if there's a huge disparity between how easy or difficult those classes are relative to the big picture thousand or a, or a couple of hundred classes right the network, right like how does that play out uh, or how how do you think it might play out depending on because it 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 surely will depend on the subset that the student is looking at, right? Absolutely. I think the distinction between the first method and the second method is that the first method doesn't touch the training information at all. It's a it's a uh, literally a template posed imposed on the decision space of the yeah. the network, right? Whereas in the second work, we are actually messing around or trying to learn new decision bounds based on the subset of classes that are presented. To the student network. And the teacher network may have had the benefit of seeing those decision boundaries in the context of the larger universe, but the student network will not. In fact, the only thing that the student network is benefiting from is the stream of test images that are coming in, in real time. So it's, it's not going to be as robust as the teacher network. Um, without a doubt. And if these classes are easy to separate, then that's one thing. But if they're harder to separate, then the student network is very likely to give a lot of classification errors, even for that class, uh, just because it will not have. Uh, and so the, the question might be, how long does the student network need to train 
uh, or adapt for the harder scenarios. So we do have this one condition over here. Um, so basically you're continuously monitoring, if you will, um, the consistency between what the student network is saying and the teacher network is saying. And if these two begin to disagree, then you probably want to keep this adapt, uh, the adaptation going on. But the, <laughs> but the premise of this is that at some point you're gonna say that this is now as good as the teacher network and shut off the teacher network and rely on this one. Um, but then you have to, but then, you know, uh, that, that's, that's where the scenario, what you're talking about becomes really important is that how do you trust the student network to, to give the right answer? And, and the one thing is that it's, is that if it's an unknown, then of course, uh, it's a reason to go back to the teacher network and, and either say, okay, um, what do you think it is? Because the student network said it's an unknown uh, or if the student network uh, is, is not able to, so, so the answer to your question is that the hope might be that for difficult classes, it is going to go down this path more often um, instead of making errors. But if the student network makes an error and the adaptation is off, then I think you're looking at a scenario which is not recoverable in this framework. Okay. All right, that makes sense. Thank you. Sure. All right. Any other questions? Last call for questions. <laughs> <laughs> While we have Professor Mahalanabis here. All right. Thank you so much. So that, that All right. Thank you so much for the opportunity to chat and uh, share. I look at this more as, you know, um, like I said, work in progress and uh, an opportunity for more discussions and yes, potential collaborations and such. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank everybody. you so much. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.